Just so you know, I never interviewed with him in the White House at all. He was never in the Oval Office. We didn't have an interview. Uh, and uh, I did a quick interview with him a long time ago, having to do with an article. But I don't know this man. I guess uh, Sloppy Steve brought him into the White House quite a bit, and it was one of those things. That's why Sloppy Steve is now looking for a job. Wow. Uh, joining us now, the author of Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House, Michael Wolf. Michael Wolf, Donald Trump says he doesn't know you. True, yeah. false. I, I, false. I, 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 in fact, I've known him since the 90s. When I was at New York Magazine, mm -hmm. he used to, I was one of the people he used to call up to complain about something that had been said. About, actually, mostly it was to complain about something that had not been said, why he had right. not been in an, in an article. Right, so you, you've, he's known you for 20 years. T totally, and when I saw him in, the, um, uh, in June 2016, so I, I walked into, uh, first thing, it was in his house in Beverly Hills. Who even knew he had a house in Beverly right. Hills? And it was like, Oh my God, Michael Wolf! They really send in the big guns here. Oh, blah blah, flattery, flattery, right. flattery, flattery. And then I saw him in the White House all the time. Well, and and, and after Maybe he truly after he got the cover knowing. story, which I just absolutely love, you actually you go after Donald Trump in that Hollywood Reporter piece, uh, but the cover he loves the cover. Right. I mean, the co it was a fairly hard piece, if not devastating. He didn't know what Brexit was two weeks before the Brexit vote. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter, good cover. You like the, the sunglasses. Uh, so also, the suggestion that you didn't have access to the White House, which some people said before. One of the things that I could never really understand uh, when you came and actually talked to me, I had no idea why they gave you access in the White House, because you, you, you uh, have written tough books, tough profiles on, on one New Yorker after another. They could have called Rupert Murdoch at any point, and well, Murdoch would have said, kick him out. They were talking to Murdoch every day. So I guess the question is, and what I never really understood is, why the hell did they let you just float around the White House in the first place? Did they? Yeah, effectively. A total disorganization, number one. Um, num number two, this idea of a, of a book. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, I'm doing a book. They would right. say, oh, a book. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then they would say, well, when does this book come out? And I would say, sometime next year. And they would say, oh, geez. You know, and, and for this White House that lives minute by minute, next mm -hmm. year was, was an eternity away. And then the other thing is the, the White House, this White House is so factionalized that if Steve Bannon was seeing me, that meant that... Kushner right. had to see me, right. so it was it was a, a, a essentially a, a daily act of triangulation. Now, when, when you oh, uh, g give me the give me the time when you were in the White House floating, from shortly after the inauguration right up and until Steve Bannon gets thrown out. Okay, so wow. you're in the good pit. So when you first got in there, Bannon and Kushner actually were allies. Yes. I mean, but that, that literally lasted days. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the weird things, you know, and Kushner was going around saying, what, what, what happened? We were so close. And then, you know, I remember it was, it was you know, Katie Walsh, the deputy um, um, chief of staff who, who, who told me, she said to, said to Kushner, uh, <laughs> you, you don't believe anything. You're diametrically opposed to everything. You and Steve. Right. How do you even think that you would have gotten along? Well, yeah. Mike, who was the original contact for you to get you into the White House? Uh, I mean, beyond Trump himself, um, who, who was completely, you know, sure, sure. I mean, it, it, it would seem like he didn't care that much. The president but it was, was sure. Sure, that's fine. But then it was, it was, um, it was Bannon and Kellyanne. Okay, so, and you have. Hours and hours of people on tape. I do, yes. I, they know I they just were... hesitate because I don't want to make, you know, you know, they're suddenly, will you release the tapes? Will you right. release the tapes? Did you and tell I... them they were being taped? Of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, just right on the table. So and this, is, this is not a facetious question now, and I'm sure you won't take it as such, given what's in the book, the compelling narrative of this book. This, you cannot put it down. The narrative is Thank so you. compelling. Was Steve Bannon at any point drunk 
during your conversations with him? Um, not to my knowledge, and in at least one instance, um, when offered a drink, he, he pushed it away. So the question then, the next question is, why did he say everything that he said? I was talking to Peggy Noonan. I don't know if, I don't know if you remember the early years of the Reagan administration when <laughs> David Stockman had a taped recorder put in front of you by the Bill Grider. And, and basically just undercut every economic argument Ronald Reagan made. And people said, why did he do it? Why did he do it? Why did Steve Bannon do this? And do you suspect that his impulses were the same? He wanted to tell, let the world know how he understood I think, the lunacy of, of yes, this. I, I think I think two things, maybe three things. Um, Steve Bannon, uh, whether you agree with him or not, went into this White House with a very particular agenda. And I think that he found that it was extremely hard to implement this agenda and that this agenda was probably not going to impl be implemented. As a matter of fact, the opposite. As, as, as Trump veered more toward, toward, toward uh, Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. that was absolutely away from Steve Bannon. Then I think Steve Bannon was in this and was kind of horrified by the fact that this White House was being run by Donald Trump's family. Um, people who were not experienced who, um, um, and who were functionally Democrats. Right. Um, and then... Um, Speaking of family, I've got to say, just as a side note, I found it fascinating that it was Ann Coulter, the voice of reason. That's one of the things this book does. It takes you behind the scenes and not what people scream into TV sets or write when they're being vitriolic. But it was actually Ann Coulter that said to Donald, to the president, you, you can't hire your family, Donald. You can't hire your family. You know, you can remove the politics from, from this. And I went into this literally with no political agenda at all. And there's really not much politics per se right. in, this, in this book. Politics don't matter. Everybody looks at Trump the same. The same. Um, and they see, you, you know, they see my, you know, this is a, this is an aberrant moment. Well, so we've been, we've been saying on this show uh, daily, and it's not just about Donald Trump, as I said earlier in the, the morning, um, would always have the most senior Democratic senators, say of Barack Obama in 2009, 2010. He doesn't know what he's doing. But of course, they never say that on the record. Well, he, for the past year, we've had people around Donald Trump, and even during the campaign, saying he's not mentally fit to be president. Now, that, I, I mean, and there is such a reluctance, and I'm not, certainly not knocking the Washington Post. They're actually being conservative with a small C. I've written twice in my column uh, a, a quote about one of people closest to Donald Trump during the campaign saying he's got early stage of dementia. He repeats the same stories over and over again. His father had it, and it's getting worse, and not a single person who works for him doesn't know he has early signs of dementia. Now, of course, they didn't think he was going to win, but twice the Washington Post hasn't, would not let me put that in my column, which, again, I salute them for having a high bar. But we are at this moment. And it's, Aren't we? And, and until your book came out, this was something we were not allowed to speak about. Now, it is, it's, the, okay, so the we, it's understanding the we. We're still in, this, in the same structure. Remember, we began this whole, uh, this, when, when Trump was elected president with the media saying, we don't want to normalize this guy. Well, in fact, they did normalize him, and they normalized these, this, um, you know, this, this, these hand grenade stories every day, so you forgot what happened the next day. And they also normalized the entire structure of, 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 of how you report on the president, which is that you can't say, you can't say what you know or all that you know because you have to go back the next day. So I'm the only one, not the only one. I am in the position of being the guy who didn't have to say, didn't say anything, right. kept my mouth shut for, for um, the better part of a year. And listen. Um, and, and listen, I was just the black hole, just listening to everything, right. and then I could say it because I'm not going back. By, by the way, oh. it, which, which is important to say, if you're Maggie Haberman at the Times, who has a, who, who does a great who job, does a great job, absolutely great job, but, but her she life, has to go back. Like what makes her a great reporter is, she's got to balance 
two competing interests. She's got to tell the truth about the Trump White House, but she's got to go back the next day. Bob Costa, the same thing at the Washington Post. He's got to tell the truth about the White House, but he's got to go back the next no, day. No, and that's this, you know, I'm getting some incoming from the daily journalists who, who, who cover this mm -hmm. because they see this in a daily journalism context instead of seeing this as a as, as a book a book is an entirely different thing i am telling a story i'm pulling this together what i'm you, trying to yeah. i'm trying to put more. put the reader I, right where i was on I, that couch i do want to say that one. one thing and then go to break mm -hmm. Mika. The, 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 the the criticism of michael's book though is that he doesn't get everything exactly right that's what happens when you're interview a thousand different people and everybody comes from their own version. There are things that people said to you about us and our show. Not accurate. But I certainly know when I read it, read it, I know which person you were talking to in the White House. So it is. It's a completely it's it's not a front page story for The New York Times we'll or The Washington Post. It's a, a, a much bigger picture. We'll talk about whether that will arm his critics uh, in Michael Wolf's uh, to my, Michael Wolf's book. When we come back, we'll take a quick break and then we're going to continue this conversation. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.